Hello folks, Dick Fairburn here. Our local uh, farm store had a ammo sale this weekend. Everything was 10% off, plus they paid the rather exorbitant Illinois state sales tax for you. So, stocked up. If you have empty magazines, might be a good time to get them loaded. Today I want to talk about something that I put almost a lifetime of study into. It was suggested by a buddy of mine, Pat. We worked together at the state police and, and did cowboy action shooting together a number of years ago. He had a suggestion for some videos for me to do on this channel and I, I loved the idea and knowing me well, he suggested that the first person I should turn my attention to would be President Theodore Roosevelt. And his idea was, let's look at some of the historical figures, historical heroes, in my case, and ask ourselves, what would Theodore Roosevelt be shooting if he were alive today? Stick around, we'll talk about it. My fascination with Theodore Roosevelt began when I was very young, uh, and I will, I will call him either President Roosevelt or T.R. throughout this. He did not like to be called Teddy, I'm told. As a young kid, my mother's side of the family had a farm, not too far from where I am in Illinois right now, and they had kind of a new farmhouse and the old original farmhouse. Not the original because the family moved to that land in 1834 where they built a log cabin to begin with. So as a rather young boy, we went down to the farm one weekend. My, my mother had one brother, so there were two children. My grandfather was still alive. And the old house was going to be torn down, well burned down actually, to put that land into cultivation. And the house was pretty bad shape, but there was a little bit of furniture and some belongings still up in the attic uh, and on the main, really in, I guess, what they would call the parlor room of the house. And the two primary pieces of furniture were a secretary and a bookcase. Now, if you don't know what a secretary is, that's usually a desk. Uh, it has a folding front that would, that would be the writing space, could fold up, get out of the way. And then a glass bookcase above it, and I can show you photographs of them and a glass front bookcase were in this room. And the, the varnish that was on them was old and black and nasty looking. You couldn't even tell what kind of wood they were. And my, my dad was a carpenter and cabinet maker. So he took his pocket knife out and kind of scratched the, the varnish off. And we decided that the secretary was black walnut and there was a matching table. Um, the bookcase, he couldn't tell for sure. He said, it's definitely not black walnut. I'm not sure what it is. We'll have to see when it gets sanded down. So my father and I refinished the secretary that my mother took possession of and table. And my uncle took the bookcase and a matching table uh, to where he lived in Kansas, and he refinished that. And it turned out to be butternut, which is, is, was a pretty common wood back then. It's, uh, it was commonly called white walnut. It, it is in the same family of trees as black walnut, but it's a lighter color. It's a softer wood. Uh, there's a lot of carving, and, and, and indeed, I'll show you a picture of this bookcase. It's It um, has a lot of intricate carving on it. And, and when I received it from my aunt, uh, it had a big, tall, hand-carved, my dad always called it gingerbread, up on top. And luckily, the gingerbread came off because my basement only has about six and a half, seven foot ceilings. Uh, so the top of it is off, but uh, it's still just, they're both beautiful pieces of antique furniture. And in bo both of those bookcases, there were books. And um, two, two volume sets. My uncle took a set of Encyclopedia Britannica's complete set from, I believe it was 1888, so pretty old. And this would have been in the late 60s, early 70s when, when we did this. 
Uh, the volume set I got was a, a, a series of very small red books, not much bigger than these, and it was the, the first volume of the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe. Kind of cool, not exactly one of my favorite authors. Uh, but later, my uncle wanted to trade me the Encyclopedia Britannica for the Poe set, and... <laughs> My mother's advice was, if he wants to trade you, then that must mean he's figured out that the Poe books are worth more than the Encyclopedia Britannica, so I didn't trade. Um, but several other books were doled out among us, and one that didn't mean anything at the time, but I, I picked up and started reading, was this one, Hunting Trips on the Prairie by Theodore Roosevelt. And I knew he was a president, and... and um, didn't know that much about him, but as, as a kid, I thought, you know, rabbit hunting and squirrel hunting were really cool. I never had the chance to hunt big game at that time, but I, I fancied myself going on to hunt out west and Africa and all kinds of cool things that we imagined when we were children. And a lot of that came from the reading of this book, and you can see the binding is kind of bad. I mean, this is over 100 years old now. And, and part of it is from age, and part of it is from me almost reading the words off of this book. I can't tell you how many times I've read it, just reread it a couple of days ago, preparing for this. And from this, I developed an interest in Roosevelt himself. I don't have all of his books. He was a very prolific writer. He made, uh, really, most of his own income was, was made as an author. And he inherited a good deal. His family was quite wealthy in New York City. But reading the books, you learn about the man. The man was born in New York City, a very, very sickly child, just racked by asthma. And at one point in his life, his father told him, if you're going to become a good man, you're just going to have to make yourself a man. And so he did. He just toughed through the asthma and the other illnesses he had and built up his body and was a boxer when he attended Harvard and became pretty much a tough guy, and looking at his military service, uh, he's kind of a badass, and if I was going to have a hero, I think he's a pretty good one to have. So I've gone on to collect a lot of his books. I've, uh, I've been to his house on uh, Sagamore Hill in, in Long Island, New York. I've visited Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota, which... Uh, um, preserves a couple of his small ranches he had there. While he was a congressman in New York City uh, on Valentine's Day, 1884, both his mother and his wife died in the same house on the same day. And his wife's death was caused by Bright's disease, which is a problem that crops up during pregnancy. So he had a newborn baby as well. And it just, it broke him. It broke his heart, it broke his spirit. You know, he made notes in his, in his journal, you know, like, practically my life has ended today. He consoled himself by going west. He had been out to North Dakota on a hunting trip a year or two before, so he went back. He bought some land and was a rancher in the early days of uh, the Little Missouri country, which was Badlands, Little Missouri Breaks country. Not high country like mountains, but rugged, very rugged country. And for several years, he lived there. He, you know, he lived the life of a ranchman and a, and a working cowboy. And, and he could only do that because he had toughened himself up to that level. Now, he was kind of a dandy. I'll show you some, some photos along the way. Uh, you know, he had a really cool buckskin-looking outfit and posed for his own photographs when he did that. He had knives made by Tiffany, the jeweler in New York. He was friendly with that family. And in fact, one of the Tiffany's sons served with him in, uh, in Cuba with the, uh, the Rough Riders. So this got me interested in Roosevelt, and I read a lot of the books that he had written. I've read a lot of books about him. This guy had an incredible lifetime. After he returned from North Dakota, he served as the police commissioner of the New York City Police Department for a while. He standardized their weapons, took a kind of a hodgepodge of different revolvers and, and picked one, a 32 caliber Colt, that uh, he had the department train with. He would sneak out at night and catch police officers sleeping or doing other 
things they weren't supposed to be doing. And he was always big on ethics. So he really turned this department around from kind of a gang of people who were almost criminals in their own right and started New York City Police Department on the road to being a, a you know, world-class ethical police department. When the, when the U.S. battleship Maine blew up near Cuba at Anchorage there, to this day, they're not real sure if it was a boiler explosion or a torpedo fired by the Cubans, but at any rate, it blew up and sank, killed a lot of American sailors, and it prompted the Spanish-American War. So in 1898, while he was the uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, he resigned, and he was ultimately given the number two position in a volunteer cavalry organization that he put together. He was offered the top post. He said he didn't think with, with his lack of military experience he should have that. So his good friend Leonard Wood, a Medal of Honor winner from the Civil War, Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, named after him. Uh, he was also an Army surgeon. Leonard Wood became the colonel of the regiment. Roosevelt became the lieutenant colonel. And during the battle, when Leonard Wood was given a field promotion to a brigadier general, then... Roosevelt was promoted to colonel and took over the regiment. They were called the Rough Riders. They, they ranged from blue blood, New York, Ivy League educated polo players to honest-to-God cowboys, Native Americans. This was the wild, literally the wildest military bunch ever put together, probably in the U.S. history. And all of these people were great patriots, and great fighters, ready to go. The battle for which the Rough Riders made their name was the charge up San Juan Hill. Actually, they charged up Kettle Hill first, and then when they took that, they turned the uh, Spanish machine guns around on San Juan Hill and were able to uh, then take San Juan Hill. Throughout this charge up the hill, Roosevelt was mounted. Now, that, now they were a cavalry unit, but Things were so disorganized at the beginning of that war that the Rough Riders had to go to Cuba without their horses. The only horses they had were for the officers. So he had a horse called Little Texas, and he and Little Texas went up and down and up and down several times about this hill, urging on his men. Uh, if you've seen the, uh, the two-part movie that uh, Tom Berenger played him, uh, it, and it's, it's very accurate, it's very true, he carried several pairs of glasses up in his hat. And at one point, a pair of glasses was clipped from his face by a bullet. He just took his hat off, put on another pair of glasses, and continued leading his men. He was nominated almost immediately for a Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, and, and this was not at his request. This was by a number of generals who served and knew what he had accomplished that day. But for political reasons, he was not granted the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was ultimately awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor posthumously in 2001, presented by President Bill Clinton. And to this day, the Roosevelt Room at the White House, which has a portrait of him writing as leader of the Rough Riders on Little Texas, off to the side in a, in a plaque, is his Medal of Honor. And it, so it resides in the White House today. So this, this little book influenced a lot of what happened in my life, and it came from that secretary on the, the family farm. The style of writing that these people had, these nonfiction writers had, they, they were telling stories in a time when there was no radio, there was no television, there was only the written word. The way they told their stories is, is just phenomenal. In this book, it, it's hunting mostly in the North Dakota area, uh, everything from bison to bighorn sheep. A, a several week long trip they took from North Dakota into what would have been Wyoming territory to the Bighorn Mountains. And I've spent a fair amount of time in the Bighorn Mountains. I've hunted there myself. Uh, maybe I've walked some of the same trails that the TR did. But to, to give you insight into the, the writing style that I think, you know, impressed me so much about this, this man. They had killed a black bear and found it to be very good to eat, but they had yet to find grizzlies. A lot of elk, a lot of black-tailed deer, they called them, is what we now know as mule deer. So I want to read you a page or so of this book, and, and, and this is kind of what caught me a number of years ago and has kept my attention for old books, old writers, and, and the, the, just that hundred years ago period. 
When in the middle of the thicket we crossed what was almost a breastwork of fallen logs, and Merrifield, this is one of the guys who came with him from Maine, Merrifield, who was leading, passed by the upright stem of a great pine. As soon as he was by it, he sank suddenly on one knee, turning half round, his face fairly aflame with excitement. As I strode past him with my rifle at the ready, there, not ten steps off, was the great bear, slowly rising from his bed among the young spruces. He had heard us, but apparently hardly knew exactly where or what we were, for he reared up on his haunches sideways to us. Then he saw us and dropped down again on all fours, the shaggy hair on his neck and shoulders seeming to bristle as he turned toward us. As he sank down on his forefeet, I had raised the rifle. His head was bent slightly down, and when I saw the top of the white bead fairly between his small, glittering, evil eyes, I pulled trigger. Half rising up, the huge beast fell over on his side in the death throes, the ball having gone into his brain, striking as fairly between the eyes as if the distance had been measured by a carpenter's rule. The whole thing was over in 20 seconds from the time I caught sight of the game. Indeed, it was over so quickly that the grizzly did not have time to show fight at all or come a step toward us. It was the first I had ever seen, and I felt not a little proud as I stood over the great brindled bulk which lay stretched out at length in the cool shade of the evergreens. He was a monstrous fellow, much larger than any I have seen since, whether alive or brought in dead by the hunters. As near as we could estimate, for of course we had nothing with which to weigh more than very small portions, he must have weighed about 1,200 pounds. And though this is not as large as some of his kind are said to grow in California, it is yet a very unusual size for a bear. He was a good deal heavier than any of our horses, and it was with the greatest difficulty that we were able to skin him. That's a, that's a story. That's an adventure. And that's the truth. How many of our presidents have been adventurers like that? How many have been writers like that, telling the truth? He went on after the Spanish-American War to be the governor of New York, and the Republican Party was afraid that he might end up as president, and a lot of them didn't like him. He was a very active, overactive kind of person. He was a personality they could hardly contain. And even then, the, 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 the regimented political machine of the day and this day, they don't like people who buck the trend. In many ways, he reminds me of Trump. He did what he thought was right, and he didn't care what anybody else thought. So to try to make sure he did not get the presidential nod after he was governor of New York, they put him on the ticket with McKinley as the vice president because everybody knew the vice president's job was the most worthless job in the world and it never led anyone greater things thereafter. But of course what they hadn't figured on is that McKinley would be assassinated and that T.R. would become the youngest man to ever be sworn in as president of the United States. He finished out McKinley's term. He ran for a term of his own and was, was, re was elected by a very wide margin. And he said early on that he would honor the example of George Washington and would not serve more than two terms. Taft was his, was his uh, hand-picked successor. Taft was in for four years. He, he pretty consistently threw out all of TR's ideas, so he did not do what he had promised Roosevelt that he would do as president. So in 1912, Roosevelt ran as a third party candidate and it was called the Progressive Party. Most people called it the Bull Moose Party because he was kind of like a wild bull moose running around the woods. And he did not win, but by splitting that Republican ticket, he put Woodrow Wilson into office, which I'm sure Wilson has his admirers, but most of us are not one when we look back. He, he was almost the first socialist type of president we had in, in our history. So that running for that term and that kind of splitting up the vote and putting Wilson in office, I think, is, is a bad mark on Roosevelt's career. But everything else about him, in my opinion, makes him hero. He was a dedicated lover of Winchester rifles. 
he ultimately, that, that we know of, um, he had 1876s. He had an 1873 in, I believe, 3220. When the 1886 came out, he left his 76 behind because the 1886 could take larger, more powerful black part powder cartridges. Although he had a pair, consecutively numbered pair of 76s custom built for him in 5095 caliber, but still the 86 was a smoother, stronger action. He went with that. He, he ultimately went with the 1892, which is the smaller version of the 1886 action, both designed by uh, John Moses Browning. 1894, when that came out, uh, he had a couple of 3030s. He killed an antelope out west with one at about 180 yards, open sights, and, and he, he would tell everyone that he was not necessarily a great shooter. He was four eyes. He had uh, you know, wireframe glasses or nez perch, the, the, the kind of glasses that would just pinch on your nose. But occasionally he would he would make a good shot, and uh, he also had an 1894 equipped with a silencer by Maxim that he used at Sagamore Hill on Long Island. And he said, you know, sometimes there are varmints that need to be dispatched, and that way it doesn't bother the neighbors. So to me, he was always at the cutting edge of weaponry, and he was an avid avid gun guy. Now the Winchesters he had all custom made to his specifications. Most of them were half octagon, half round barrels. They had shotgun butts. They had the finest wood. Many of them were engraved. Some were even gold inlaid. Uh, these, these are fancy rifles, and this was a guy who could afford them. In his service in Cuba, he and most of his officers had Winchester 95. I, I believe that was Browning's last lever action design. And they were chambered for the 3040 Krag cartridge, 3040... 30 U.S. government cartridge that his men were firing in the 1898 Crags. His sidearm in Cuba was an 1895 Colt revolver and 38 Long Colt that had been recovered from the wreck of the Maine, refitted from the exposure to seawater, and that's what he carried as a sidearm when he charged up San Juan Hill. And in his notes, in, in the Rough Riders book, he said when he first jumped off of Little Texas at the top, when they, when they got to the barbed wire and, and the, the trenches, uh, that he fired the revolver at two soldiers, and he said he missed one clean. Let me read it here. As soon as he dismounted from the charge, missing one enemy soldier, but hitting the second, stating the soldier doubled up as neatly as a jackrabbit. So this is a man who's been there, and he, he's done it. The Colt Single Action Revolvers, 1873 model, was one of his favorites. He had one that was fully engraved, silver plated, with ivory grips. There are ivory grips that had a steer's head carved onto them, and there was another set of grips that show up in one of the photographs he had with his entwined TR initials, uh, and these of course were ivory, ivory grips. And for the most part they were chambered for the 44 WCF, what we would call the 4440 now. He had an 1899 FN pistol chambered for the 32 ACP, extensively engraved, gold inlaid, pearl grips, and he left that, they say, on the nightstand at the White House, or carried it with him quite a lot. He was once told by someone that carrying a concealed weapon was illegal, and he said, they got McKinley, but they won't get me without a fight. Because of McKinley's assassination, Roosevelt was the first president to have full-time Secret Service protection, but he went armed on his own. And knowing him, I would say they probably practiced a lot because he loved to shoot. After leaving the White House, not running for that third term until later as a third-party candidate, he organized a safari to Africa. And this was not a minor undertaking. This was a huge deal. And by the way, when I say he left the White House, he was the first president to call that building the White House. And so his terminology is, is obviously what we use today. He took his son Kermit with him on the safari. They took along 15 wooden crates of rifles, shotguns, and ammunition. And the whole planning, training, traveling, and everything else of this safari took almost a year. He mostly shot museum pieces that ended up in natural history museums in both uh, New York and I believe some in Chicago. He had made a caliber 500 450 Nitro Express double rifle by Holland and Holland. And this is the, the royal grade with full engraving, gold inlay, and, and just a phenomenal side-by-side -side rifle, which he called his big stick. 
He had custom 1895 Winchesters made chamber. He had three of these made in 405 Winchester, which was the most powerful cartridge ever chambered in a Winchester rifle, in terms, at least in terms of kinetic energy. And of course, with the 95 lever action, since there was no tubular magazine underneath, but, but a stacked magazine, cartridges could be fitted in there in such a way that they could have more pointed bullets. Uh, the 405 had a little bit more of a slight point on the bullet. And a lot of people, including myself, have said that, that uh, he called the 405 his big medicine. I went back and reread African Game Trails and, and dug through there and found it. No, he called it his medicine for lions, not big medicine. He also took U.S. Springfield bolt action rifles. Okay, the Springfield came out in 1903, was modernized in 06, and originally was chained for the 30 3 cartridge, which was then changed to the 30 6 that we know today with a, a lighter, sharp pointed bullet. And he, took his, he had custom made Springfield bolt action rifles made by Springfield Armory, and they were chambered in the 30 3 cartridge. So he took that cartridge both in a bolt action Springfield, as well as having some Winchester 95s chambered in that cartridge. So throughout his life, Theodore Roosevelt tended to use the most modern firearms available, including silencers when, when they came on the market from Hiram Mac, Maxim. And he certainly spent a lot of money on his shooting irons. Uh, these are not run-of-the-mill guns by any stretch of the imagination. His eyesight was never the best. He always recommended getting in as close as possible to make better shots. In, in his book, Hunting Trips on the Prairie, he recounted the old Norse Vikings advice. If you go in close enough, your sword will be long enough. And he always attempted to get in close both for ethical shooting and simply because he couldn't see that well. And he knew his limitations, which is uh, that's part of the man's character as well. All right, so I've bored you with a little TR history and, and you know fawned over him as someone that I'm impressed by. So what do I think TR would be carrying today? What, what kind of shooting irons would the president have if he were alive today? And I think to my... To my personal preferences. I said I, I love Winchester rifles and I love Colt pistols. I can find no mention anywhere of TR ever firing or owning a 1911 pattern pistol, the Browning designed Colt 45 government model. But I can't imagine him not having messed with this when it came out. Uh, he, he loved military weapons. He loved to try out new things. Often shot them right outside the back door of the White House. So I think today... His primary heavy sidearm, I think he'd be a lot like the one that I prefer. Probably a Colt lightweight commander chambered for the 45. Lightweight's easier to carry. It's a little bit smaller. Um, you know, he's not going to carry it in a, in a uniform or duty style holster. He's going to be carrying it probably concealed carry, which he did as president. Um, and, and I'd say that, that that's, that's custom built. Now, now, my good friend that I think is probably the the ultimate 1911 custom builders, Richard Heine, Quincy, Illinois. So I, I could see him having a full build by Richard Heine with, uh, you know, upgraded sights, maybe the tritium inserts at night. He would go for the latest technology, and I think he would probably practice with it enough to be fairly skilled. Now, he liked that FN, that little 1899. He also had a Colt, small Colt semi-automatic in 32 that he used a lot. So I could see him going for an, a small pistol, kind of a pocket pistol at times as well. Maybe in a vest pocket. And, so maybe a small 1911 style pistol. Maybe a Kimber Micro 9, Springfield Armory EMP. And of course, they're, they're not chambered in 45, so it'd be a 9 or a 40 uh, in the case of the EMP. Probably a 9mm. Hey, like 32 caliber pocket pistol, so an upgrade to 9mm would be significant. With his bad eyesight, I suspect he would also have eagerly switched over to optical devices on his hunting rifles. That takes the bad vision out of the equation and puts everything on that single focal plane. So I could see him hunting primarily with a modern bolt action. I mean, there are certainly semi-autos out there, 
both modern sporting rifles and, and you know, the Browning, I believe, still makes the sporting BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle. And what caliber? Maybe a thirty out six. You know, that's something he used the, from the very beginning, the thirty out three, and he's probably be happy with it for deer and antelope. But if he's hunting bigger game, he liked those big black powder cartridges. So maybe he would like a bigger smokeless cartridge, something like a three thirty eight Winchester Magnum. And of course, if you were going to Africa, that H and H Royal Double Rifle and five hundred four fifty was is just as cutting edge today as it was then, and still the choice for wealthy hunters when they go after dangerous game in Africa. He used a number of different shotguns over his time, virtually all side-by-side -side double shotguns. But I think he probably, as soon as that Browning A5 came on the market, that's that reliable semi-automatic, I bet he would have tried one of those. There's still nothing wrong with a really nice side-by-side -side double for, for waterfowl or upland game. He used both Parker and Fox in American-made side-by-side -side shotguns over the years. As I said, I would not call him Teddy. I will call him TR, or President Roosevelt. Several people mentioned towards the end of his life that he preferred to be addressed as Colonel, not Mr. President, because he thought his time as Colonel of the Rough Riders was probably the peak of his life. Being President was nearly as good, but uh, this guy loved the adventure of being with the Rough Riders. So, in the course of his life, he was a respected public servant. Unfortunately, a lot of our public servants aren't respectable nowadays, and a lot of them weren't then, so we certainly haven't improved. He was a soldier, an author, a rancher, a governor, a police commissioner, and a man worthy of our respect, certainly worthy of my respect. He launched the United States onto the world stage. He helped build the Panama Canal, and if you read much about that, he bent a lot of rules, maybe broke a few laws to get that done. But he saw that as moving the United States well ahead in terms of military prowess. He was also the biggest conservationist of any president we have ever had. He put millions of acres of federal land into reserves, national forests, national parks, national monuments. He did not create the first national park, Yellowstone National Park, because that was well ahead of his time to do so. But he put more land into wildlife refuges and other preservationist titles than any other president we had. And he did this because he knew that hunters love the game they chase. We are not wanton slayers of the game as, as you know, the, the greenies like to make us out to be. Nobody cares more for the game that we hunt than hunters. No one spends more money towards preserving the land and preserving the game than hunters. The Pittman-Robertson Act, which I believe was enacted in 1832, puts an 11% excise tax on guns, ammunition, fishing tackle. A lot of those outdoor things that we buy and use have that 11% excise tax built into them. That money goes into a special fund, which is to buy land for game preserves, for wildlife refuges, to build shooting facilities, ranges. So the conservation that's being paid for in the United States today is primarily being paid for by hunters and fishermen, not by bird watchers and not by greenpeacers, although they want you to believe that. That all came about from the leadership of Theodore Roosevelt. Another fascinating aspect to his life are his sons. Uh, technically, he was Theodore Roosevelt Jr. His father was named Theodore as well. And he had a son named Theodore Roosevelt who was actually addressed as Jr. most of the time. Theodore Jr. served in World War I and was widely respected. When World War II started, he went back into the Army Reserve. On D-Day, he was a Brigadier General, second in command of an infantry division. And he wanted to go with the first wave that hit the beach. And his commanding officer, the major general, denied him. 
until finally he put the request in writing and explained why he, as the second in command, should be in that first wave to be able to report back and lead those troops. And when it was put in writing, the Major General relented. He was there. He served on D-Day. He was the most senior man on the beach. He was the oldest man on the beach. He died just a couple of weeks later of a heart attack. But he was ultimately given the Medal of Honor for his service on D-Day. So when Theodore Sr., the president, was given the Congressional Medal of Honor in 2001, that meant we had a father-son team who had both won a Medal of Honor. There is only one other father-son team who have both won Congressional Medals of Honor. And whoever can tell me their names, it's, it's an easy Google search, whoever can tell me the names of the other father-son team who won a Congressional Medal of Honor in U.S. history, I'll send you a free copy of my uh, Building a Better Gunfighter book. So uh, put it in the comments and give me a way to get it to you. That'll be a reward. For several years at the Friends of the NRA banquets, they were able to take historical weapons from the past and fire them and put those fired cartridge cases and spent bullets into plaques like this one you see here. One was the Dirty Harry gun from the movie. Another, I recall, was John Dillinger, a stolen submachine gun. Thompson that he uh, liberated from uh, during a jail escape in Indiana. When this one came up for auction at the banquet, I had to have it, and I didn't really care what I was going to have to pay for it. I didn't pay an exorbitant fee, but this is a cartridge case and spent bullet fired from one of the Gatling guns that was used the day of the charge up San Juan Hill. So this Gatling gun was fired during the battle, and I'll show you a close-up of both the uh, cartridge case and the verbiage that goes along with it. The photograph was the Rough Riders at the top of San Juan Hill, and interestingly, this photo, and, and the, the photo you almost always see, is one where Roosevelt in the center is wearing a hat. A number of years ago, when I visited Sagamore Hill on Long Island, they had a photograph available that was printed from the actual negative. So this is not a, uh, a linotype printing. It's an actual photographic image that I obtained there, and that shows him without a hat. So here's the story of this fired cartridge case and spent bullet, the Battle of San Juan Hill. And in his book, The Rough Riders, he did indeed label that as my crowded hour. Uh, this recounts that First Lieutenant John H. Parker of the 13th U.S. Infantry, who conceived of the idea of a Gatling gun battery in support of the charge. As Rough Riders advanced first up Kettle Hill and then San Juan Heights, Parker's Gatling gun detachment of four Colt-made Model 1895 Gatling guns in 3440 Crag kept up an incessant fire. Parker wrote, The guns were pushed right up into the hottest place there was in the battlefield and successfully subdued the Spanish fire. He estimated the entire charge lasted less than 10 minutes altogether, and in that time he expended over 18,000 rounds of ammunition. The bullets and casings included in this piece were fired on uh, May 27th, May 28th, 2011 from one of the four Gatling guns used at the Battle of San Juan Hill. And uh, to me, this is quite a special memento. Here's the, the commonly seen print that's a part of this uh, memento with the fired cartridge case. And you can see Roosevelt there in the center, and he is wearing his campaign hat. This is the print I obtained at Sagamore Hill. This is the one printed from the actual negative taken that day. And you can see this one, uh, the president, is not wearing a hat. 
Let me know what you think about Theodore Roosevelt as a person, as a president, as a hunter, as a, as a gun guy. Okay? He would be a gun nut today because he was a gun nut then. What do you think he'd be carrying? Also tell me who else you'd like to see. This could be an interesting series. Who else would we look at in history and say, what kind of guns do they use at, in their time? What kind of guns do we think they would use in our time? And I hope you find this talk interesting. Uh, as I said, this has been a lifelong study for me. kind of comes from my heart. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. And uh, our times are uncertain, ladies and gentlemen. Get your magazines loaded. And be safe out there. Thank you. Okay, we got them both here now. You ready? Bud got one. Ginger got one. Uh -huh. Oh, she missed it. She usually gets them, doesn't she, bud? Mm -hmm. Okay, girl, last one. Ready? You ready? Yeah! That's all there is till next time.